Good morning or good afternoon or good evening to everyone listening in uh, to this webinar. On behalf of the Institute of International and European Affairs, I, I'd like to extend a warm welcome to you for this special event we have with the special representative of the UN Secretary General and head of the uh, UN Stabilization Mission in the DRC, Leila Sarugi. We're de delighted, absolutely delighted to have Leila speaking to us today at a time of great challenge for the DRC and also for the UN and its role within the, the DRC. So we look forward very much to what Leila will, will have to say to us. Um, this is the final event of 2020 for the uh, IIEA's Development Matters series, which is supported by Irish Aid. The Special Representative will speak to us for about 20 minutes, and then we will go into a Q&A session. Both uh, sessions are on the record. Please feel free to join the discussion using the Q&A function on the Zoom. You can send in questions throughout the session as they occur to you, and we will get to as many of them as possible uh, in the Q&A session. You can join the discussion on Twitter using the handle at IIEA, and we are also live streaming this event. So with that, I'd like to invite Alan Gibbons, who is the Africa Director with Irish Aid, to offer a few words of introduction to our speaker. Alan. Thanks very much, David, and uh, good afternoon. Um, I wish to warmly welcome Special Representative Zarugi uh, to this Development Matters Lecture. I want to thank you, SRSG, for joining us today and uh, speaking to us about the work of the UN Stabilization Mission in the Democratic Republic of Congo, MONUSCO, uh, which you've led for almost three years. SRSG Zarugi was appointed Special Representative of the UN Secretary General and Head of MONUSCO in February 2018. She previously served as Special Representative of the Secretary General for Children in Armed Conflict and Deputy Special Representative of the Secretary General in MONUSCO. SRSG Zarugi is a distinguished legal expert in the fields of human rights and the administration of justice. She has served as chair and member of the Working Group on Arbitrary Detention under the United Nations Human Rights Council, as well as in a number of roles in its predecessor, the Commission on Human Rights. She has also served as a member of the Supreme Court of Algeria. We are delighted to have such a very distinguished speaker with us today. Your engagement with us comes at a most opportune moment. Just ahead of the anticipated renewal of the MONUSCO mandate later this month, a, a day after your most recent briefing of the UN Security Council on the Secretary General's latest report on MONUSCO, and just over three weeks before Ireland will take our seat for two years on the UN Security Council from the beginning of January. Ireland has a long and proud tradition of peacekeeping. This year marks the 60th anniversary of our first deployment of troops to a UN peacekeeping mission in Africa in 1960 to the ONUC mission in what is today DRC. Ireland currently contributes military personnel to the MONUSCO mission and has done so since its inception. It is important that we acknowledge the significance of the mission in DRC, especially in terms of having a positive impact on the lives of the Congolese people, supporting the stabilization of large parts of the DRC while strengthening governance and seeking to protect human rights. This has been done in spite of the persist persistent activities of armed groups which have sought to undermine peace, security, and humanitarian operations, especially in Eastern DRC, and remain a cause of serious concern. We seem to be entering a critical period for MONUSCO and the DRC in terms of both politics and security. Special Representative, I look forward to hearing your insights on how the gains achieved so far can be ensured and consolidated as the mission continues to grapple with the additional challenges arising from the COVID-19 pandemic and through the progressive and phased drawdown of the mission over the coming years. 
Ireland has a clear interest in the consolidation of stability and prosperity in the DRC and the wider region. And we see MONUSCO as an important partner in this context. We look forward to continuing that support as UN Security Council members from next month. I'm very much looking forward to hearing your talk today and the conversation that will follow. Thank you again for being with us today. Thanks, Alan. Leila, you have the floor. Thank you very much, David. Thank you, Alan. Thank you, uh, uh, the International, the uh, Institute of International uh, uh, and European Affairs, for the invitation for choosing this subject, for allowing us to exchange with a future member of the Security Council. As you know, a mission, peacekeeping mission, is the baby of the Security Council. The mandate is given by the Security Council and we report and we are accountable vis-a-vis -vis the Security Council. So for us, it's very important that uh, uh, new members are interested in our work here and following what, what will, uh, uh, that, how their contribution can help peace, stability and security. And as you mentioned, uh, you were uh, uh, supporting this mission from its uh, uh, first days. And uh, uh, I think that we, this is for us a great opportunity. So I would like really to emphasize this. Uh, David and me, we knew each other uh, in New York when in my previous capacity as SRG for Children Armed Conflict. And I enjoyed at the time your support and the support of Ireland on many issues. So I would like to emphasize this. And I hope that in this context also, the mission and uh, the Congolese people will enjoy the support to help them uh, improve, uh, move in the right direction and build and strengthen the stability and uh, 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 the uh, uh, preventing crisis uh, in this country. 100 million inhabitant, 2.5 million uh, a square kilometer, nine bordering countries, some of them also in conflict or with and with armed with uh, with mission like Central African Republic, like South Sudan. Uh, so to speak about today, if we don't have just a look for the past, we may not understand. Uh, uh, the mission is here since 1999. Monuk at the past at the time. And then in 2009, the MONUC become MONUSCO. The S of stabilization uh, it came in to focus on the stabilization and not just on ending conflict. When the mission arrived in this country, the country was, uh, uh, the war was raging the whole country. Uh, nine international, nine armed forces from nine country were fighting in this country. Uh, uh, so that, that was from where the mission started. If we think about this time where the whole country was a cut in war, uh, the country was divided uh, between uh, uh, RCD Goma in the east, MLC in the west, uh, 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 um, uh, uh, Afdel coming to Kinshasa, etc. All this when we think about today and we speak about conflict, uh, when I arrived in 2008, the situation was almost, the whole country was affected by conflict. When I was GSRG at the time, Deputy Special Representative on rule of law. I returned in 2008, we were present in 16 provinces out of 26. After the election of 2008, when we managed to help this country to have a peaceful uh, election that was really a, a high risk for the stability of the country, two years delay, uh, tension uh, uh, at the highest uh, uh, point. And then we helped with our partner, with the Congolese, with many people to help this process to go through smoothly and have uh, an election that ended up peacefully with transfer of power from a president that was that took power in the condition you know by arms 
uh, uh, and then uh, uh, a president uh, that come from the opposition, the historic uh, opposition, the father of Chesekedi, as you know, UDPS. So for me, coming from South as an Algerian, as an African, I consider that this is the beginning of the, a positive process. Whatsoever we can say about the election, because you cannot come from war, from taking power by force, from inheriting it from your father or from God to become a democracy. It's always a process. And the process start to uh, advance when you have uh, uh, alternance. If you have the same people elected, there is no democracy. You are still in the risk of one day someone will throw you out. Having someone that lead power through election is not nothing. And that's why when we managed to go through this process, the mission decided to close out of the 16 offices that were in 16 provinces, we closed eight. And we added nine last this year. So nine out of 16. So we are today present operationally in six provinces, plus the seventh is Kinshasa, the headquarter. So that's when you look at this, it's not nothing that you find a country blowing up Congo stayed in his border as inherited since the independence. Not, nothing was lost. Nothing was grabbed by someone else. So uh, you remember it was a, a, a temptation of uh, a separatism uh, in, in, in Katanga in many places. You, are, you remember armed group are everyone occupying an area. Even the UN to go to a place need to have the authorization from the leader of these armed groups to land. So all these things are behind us. Today, we are facing another, other challenges. I'm not saying that everything is over, but still, this is just when you think, and I'm not the one saying it. The prime minister uh, of Congo, who is now prime minister, when I went to see him the first time after his appointment, he told me, Leila, when I was uh, 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 governor of at Katanga, out of 422 territories, only 22 were not in conflict. Today, we don't have more than 22 in conflict. That's the success of the mission. And he is the one saying that, because effectively, when we think about from where we come, we cannot say today that we are stalling, the mission is not doing anything, you UN have no added value, we managed to have today, even with all the tension that is ongoing, people are speaking as politician. Nobody is threat threatening to rage a war or to take or to create an armed group and to go and fight to take power. You have today in this country Katumbi, Bemba, Kabila, Chesekedi, Fayulu, the big leaders uh, of the opposition and the coalition sitting in the country, living in the country. Nobody is going to arrest someone. And the history of Congo, when you lose power, either you are, in the, you are dead, you are in prison, or you are in exile. There is no, no other option. No other option. Exile, prison, or dead. So having these people that were fighting each other in the election of 2018, here in the country, living in the country, organizing meeting, fighting each other like every politician. That's what we like to keep. And that's what we are trying to tell them. Whatsoever be your division, whatsoever be the tension that you can have, you are not enemy. In politics, you could be opponent, you could be a, a, par a partisan or against, but you are not enemy. I'm not going like in war to finish the enemy. You are my partner or my opponent. And we disagree. We love our country. We disagree on the way we govern it or uh, the way we manage it. But it's not that I would like to kill you or you kill me. This is something extremely important to prepare for the stability, 
to prepare for then moving on development, moving on reconciliation, identifying the root causes, working on how we can address these root causes, what is feeding this conflict that is still ongoing in three or four provinces today, how we can address it, how we can strengthen state authority, how we can push the fight against impunity, how we can build the capacity of the army, of the police, of justice, how we can reconcile community that choose to fight each other, how we can build uh, uh, the access to land and the use of land for people that are fighting because one is herders, the other are agriculture, the other are creuser, uh, as we say, uh, for the, those who are working in the mineral illegally. So all these things uh, you cannot deal with unless you have a minimum of peace a minimum of stability. And people start thinking about the broader problem and start thinking about what is fueling the conflict. Because when you speak at the first stage with the people, they don't speak about what is fueling the conflict. They just would like to finish the enemy. Go and fight. UNESCO is not protecting civilians because you are not fighting. But when you start working on this issue, and I would like to emphasize, because as you know, uh, uh, the, the mandate of the mission in this resolution 2502 is focusing on two major issues. Is one is protection of civilian, and second is help stabilization, building capacity. And that's for me, uh, the two major uh, uh, also uh, uh, um, priorities that we have to focus on even in the future, because that's how we can build the stability in DRC and how we can move forward. Now, uh, if I speak about, uh, I think you followed what I said to the council, you are aware what we put in the, next, in the last report of the Secretary General with regard to our exit strategy. Because when we speak about exit strategy, when we speak about drawdown, I remember when I arrived to the Congo to, to, to in 2008, I was told that after the election of 2006, the mission is preparing for drawdown. And then I arrived and the war started with the CNDP. That was a month after my arrival. So I was like shocked. I thought that I will work on building capacity and I end up building uh, uh, all what become now uh, the uh, due diligence policy, the uh, uh, protection of civilian tools, etc., because we were stuck in this situation and trying to address it after getting from the council a mandate to support the uh, FRDC and at the same time to uh, fight armed groups. So that's uh, just to explain from where we come. And uh, 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 every three, four years, the Security Council think about draw down, but the situation don't, don't allow. So what we, are, what we did and why when we closed the eight offices, it was a decision taken by the mission because we assessed that our presence is not needed. What we are trying to do in the next phase to close the, uh, uh, the CASAIs, for example, why we, we said that we can close the CASAIs because we don't have conflict in the CASAI now because the Kamwin and Sapu uh, uh, phenomenon is, uh, is over after the election of Chesekedi. This is the part from where he come, from where this opposition come, so came. So uh, uh, they, and they returned to the community. So the challenge that we have there is to ensure the stability and to ensure that the core function of the state are there, justice, police, correction, at local administration, program for agriculture, helping these people to be reintegrated and having a job, reconcil reconciling the community that were in the midst of the conflict. So that's the work that we would like to achieve, not as a mission, the mission providing support, openings and space, having the leverage to build this space for the country team, for other partners, the European Union is interested, the American, the uh, British, uh, 
the uh, also the uh, uh, Canada, Canada, Canadian. So many countries are interested if the situation is stable and if they can advance and there is no risk. So that's why we propose that in next June, we will close these two provinces. Then we will stay in four provinces. That's North Kivu, South Kivu, Ituri, and Tanganyika. In our assessment, Tanganyika, we can close either by the end of 2021 or mid 2022, if the situation stays stable. Why? Because in Tanganyika, it's really a local conflict. There is no regional dimension. There is no mineral in it. There is no, it's the, 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 the conflict that uh, uh, between the, the indigenous, the Tua, the Pygmy, and the Bantu. And it's more something that you can address if you help the Tua to, uh, 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 to have a living. Because what happened is these people used to live in the bush, eat animals. They were, uh, they were, herd, they were uh, gather and hunter. And the, the bush is not able now to feed them. So they are coming out. So it's to help them to provide. So it's a work that we would like to convince not only the government, local government, but also. Uh, so that's why we consider that it's feasible. Now, with regard to the three provinces, North Kivu, South Kivu, Italy, that's for me. And that's what we said yesterday to the council. It's early to speak about benchmark. It's early to speak about when we will leave because the conflict is still structured in the economy de guerre, in the war economy. It's about, it, you have the regional dimension, you have the uh, minerals, you have the access and the use of land, you have the ethnicity, and then uh, you have the region, I don't know if I mentioned the regional dimension, but the regional dimension. So all this linked and all this is why it is what fueled this. It's the uh, the the um, la faiblesse, the the um, the weakness of the uh, state authority, because in many area it's very uh, uh, seldom that you find justice, police, uh, uh, military that can ensure law and order and ensure that people when they have a problem they go to the judge not they take an arm to defend themselves. So uh, that's why it's linked. You cannot address the, the conflict unless you identify the root causes and you work on them and you address them through uh, 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 sustainable and uh, 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 responsible uh, work that allow for this to, to be sustained. Of course, this is linked to what we are, we started already working on certain issues, like for example, fighting impunity. You remember that in the past, armed group, the, the, the national army were listed for recruitment and use of children. We work, I remember when I arrived, the children were among the military in the, nobody was hiding them, but uh, we worked with them and we end this practice and we have no child that is inside the army today because we put in place the tools, the mechanism that allow for, first of all, have an age verification when you have to enter the army, even when you come from armed groups. Then you have uh, the, the military uh, uh, justice that can uh, 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 prosecute those who are recruiting children. And then you have uh, uh, the, the tools that allow to ensure that uh, 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 this is well understood and accepted and nobody will think about bringing children in the army. That was, was something that took us some time, but we managed to do it. We are, even when we speak about sexual violence, you remember in the past sexual violence, the army was accused of on command responsibility. That's the commander with his unit that goes and commits rapes against, against uh, 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 women or girls or boys. Now, even if you have still cases of sexual violence, it's individual cases that a military, and you have the military just that we are supporting to uh, uh, prosecute and arrest those who are committing this, uh, this, these crimes. 
And you just two a few days ago, you you are aware of Cheka uh, uh, trial uh, that was involved in the mass rape in Walikali in two thousand seven and eight. Uh, I, it was the, the major uh, major rape was in two thousand ten, but still since two thousand seven they were committing this atrocity. He was sentenced to life imprisonment, and we were involved, and we ensure that fair trial principle, because that's also the role of the mission. It's not just to uh, take revenge. We, we, we taught and we help people to understand revenge is not the attitude of national institution against your own people. It's you apply the law. You ensure that the one who commits the, the worst crime deserve a fair trial, have access to a lawyer, have access to uh, the evidence, and uh, if sentenced, sentenced according to the law. And that's also what we do to build this capacity to ensure, because that's how you build the stability. You cannot build the stability if people inside their country start revenging against each other. You have to show that even if you commit the worst crime, the, the, you will be uh, 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 handle accountable according to uh, legal framework and law. And, and we manage in this process of providing support to the criminal chain and military justice criminal chain to ensure that the lawyer, that the, uh, that the victim, but also the accused have access to a lawyer to defend their right. These are, and we used uh, American Bar Association, Avocats on Frontières, involving them to ensure that this happened. So just to give you an idea about the work that the mission do, it's like teaching and helping things to move forward in the right direction. At the same time, of course, you have always tension. You have something that can happen and blow up here in Kinshasa. Now we have a, this big tension with regard to the political uh, 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 arrangement that exists after the election and the coalition and uh, 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 what is happening, you are following that uh, the president uh, announced the end of the coalition and the, the, the counterpart is questioning this decision and we will continue to work to ensure whatsoever be the problems, you will try to help people to solve them peacefully through dialogue and through the rules and regulation that exist. And of course, with the support of their partner of the international communities, Security Council, ourselves, etc., regional uh, partner uh, uh, in, in the African Union, in the SADC, in, and, and the ICGLR, the, the, the Great Lake region, etc. So that's what we, uh, just to give you a sense of how a mission deployed in a country. People sometimes say the mission is here for 20 years. What did you, the conflict is still ongoing. And MONUSCO is, have nothing, did not realize anything because people think when they hear about a group were killed, a civilian are paying a high price, still a, a emergency situation, humanitarian crisis. All this is real. And we are in the mid of a, 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 a pandemic with a very weak, uh, uh, capacity, health capacity, with a very weak institution on the ground. All this we have to keep it in mind, but still we are helping this to not blow up in a major crisis where the country will not be able to uh, uh, address, uh, uh, even with the limited capacity, at least to not make the big mistake that create a major crisis. So that's why a mission the mission is still here. And in my opinion, why Congo is now even in big tension? Because we are in a real transition. Because, because we don't have election where the same party change a president, but still the same party. And in, in many countries still, when you have election, it's a big party in control and make uh, change every uh, uh, eight years or 10 years or whatever. But here you are in the heart of something that the Congo have never experienced. You have president of state 18 years as president and his father was president. And then you are 
he is transferring the power to someone else and learning how we, we, we work in this context how we can uh, 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 engage uh, uh, in a constructive way with the, someone with whom I disagree on the way uh, I am handling that is not something easy because it's not in the culture. It's not something that we used to. We don't have the tools that allow us to, uh, to, to, find, to overcome crises like this. So that's why I think rather than seeing this as negative, we have to see it as positive and try to help. I, I always say to the Congolese, I don't want that what happened in 2018 become an accident de l'histoire. I don't want that this is just an accident, an incident, an incident, and then we forget about it and we return to a taking power by, a, uh, by force or whatever. So it's important to build on what happened to ensure that next election will take place on time, will be peaceful, we repeat it several times, and then we can say stability is now there. So that's the role of the international community supporting this country. That's our responsibility as a mission deployed. And I think it's for us uh, uh, important, not only to support, but also to be proactive and to see what could happen and how we can uh, help avoiding something that maybe our partner, because they don't have all the experience, uh, not seeing it at the time. At the same time, you have to continue to focus on the problem of the country, not just focusing on the political crisis. You have to continue to focus on the pandemic, focus on Ebola. We closed two, uh, three, since my arrival in 2008, we closed three Ebola outbreak. To, uh, in uh, in uh, in uh, 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 Equator, when I arrived in 2007, in the middle of the election, and then in uh, in uh, in North Kivu, uh, and then now in uh, in uh, in uh, uh, Equator. So three outbreak that we manage in this country with very limited capacity to close them. So that's not nothing, because you are helping a country to learn how to deal with this kind of situation that will happen in the future, because we have still the root causes that allow for Ebola to, to emerge because people eat uh, 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 the, the meat of the, the bush and they get it from animals and the outbreak restart. So that's, that's a reality that we have to keep in mind. We have the pandemic of uh, 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 COVID that we, our first priority was to make sure that the mission will not be a vector of transmission. Because if you are a vector of transmission, then you will be blamed. You are the one who bring the, 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 the virus. And then you will be so focused on yourself and you forget to do your job. So we were very, we were the first mission to take very, very uh, 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 proactive action to ensure we stop any uh, trans, uh, any uh, rotation, we stop even our, to our civilian that were outside the country, we said, stay there until we are ready. We build the isolation and quarantine uh, 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 camps. We work to ensure that we build our capa medical capacity to not become a burden on the local uh, medical uh, uh, system that is very limited. So we did this and we managed in comparison with other mission we have, uh, we, I think we, we manage well, we have total 173 cases, 153 already uh, recovered, six us uh, uh, died and uh, uh, we are uh, working now, I think we have five uh, cases that are ongoing. So I think just to give uh, 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 you an idea how mission, in such a context can play a positive role by, uh, uh, first of all, handling difficult situation, second, helping the partner how to uh, also learn because it's not to do instead. I always repeat to my people, we are not who are here to replace, we are here to support because replacing is not sustainable. You will leave and you leave behind you the whole. 
But if you support and let people do what they have to do, then that's your added value. Is not to, and the second issue that we have to keep in mind is to always repeat that we are not stars. We are not here to show how competent and how efficient we are. We have to be very modest and to keep low profile and to give the credit to the local because that will encourage them to do more, to help uh, uh, their capacity to improve and to also take our responsibility. We also need to help them to address the regional dimension because you are in conflict, you are surrounded by many countries and you have part of your conflict is also linked with other uh, uh, regions. So you have to help them how they address these challenges and how they move forward. Just you can stop me when you think uh, I, I can consume my time. Eh? Do not hesitate. You, I wouldn't. I wouldn't dream of that. But you're you're covering such interesting ground, and there are so many issues. But perhaps uh, since you've opened up the opportunity, we might go into the the broader uh, engagement with the audience. There are so many things that I people will will want to ask you. Um, can I just ask for myself one question to begin with? I, I mean, Ireland is obviously looking forward to any way in which it can support the work of uh, MINUSCO and yourself when we joined the Council. You mentioned the two priorities which are highlighted in the most recent resolution, namely protection of civilians and building capacity. And I, I would be confident that Ireland will want to support you specifically on those. Um, but are there particular uh, are there other issues that you would like Ireland to keep an eye on as it takes up its responsibility? Uh, thank you very much. I think that, uh, yes, when we speak, as I mentioned, speaking about uh, 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 the two uh, major uh, 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 mandate that we are given by the Council, uh, protection of civilian, I am struggling since uh, 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 I start working on peacekeeping in reality to insist that protection of civilian is not about raging a war. Peacekeeping are not deployed in a country to rage a war. They are deployed to help to uh, uh, shut down the arms and to build the peace. So when we speak about uh, uh, protection of civilian, many people think about our military. Yes, our military are needed. Yes, they have to deliver. Yes, because they are the one who will allow us to access area that we will never be able to access without their presence. Yes, they are needed to support the local authority in their uh, 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 operation against armed groups. Many spoilers, national and foreign that are operating in Congo. So, uh, yeah, but we need to accompany this process by identifying the root causes by having a holistic approach. And this holistic approach mean justice, mean human rights, mean uh, protecting vulnerable people, mean working on the root causes, like how we can ensure control of minerals uh, that is feeding the conflict, how we can ensure that the SSR, the security sector reform is taking seriously place and focusing not only on training, but on building the capacity of the FRDC on the ground, because you cannot be a professional army if you don't have barracks, if you cannot control the, uh, uh, the arms that you have, if you cannot control your own people and ensure that they receive their salary, they receive that their family are hosted, et cetera, et cetera. So these are the work that I see if we contribute to uh, 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 building, for example, uh, the access to land and the use of land ensure that this is not fueling the conflict. The uh, minerals, uh, the uh, professionalization of the army, the DDR process ending disintegration in the national army of former armed groups recognizing their ranks and files and uh, allowing them to wear the uniform and stay where they used to prey on the population. 
So we are managing to get the government on board. We need the support of the partners to make it possible. It's not just to speak about it, because when you say, I will not integrate you in the army, forget about it, you will not get it. No amnesty, no ranks, no file, but you know, someone who know how to use arms will never beg in the street. Either you fix their problems or you end up fighting them again. So it's important that we have some programmatic activities that allow for these people to be integrated in their community and to not prey on their community by also deploying justice, et cetera, et cetera. In my opinion, this kind of program uh, that in, if they are well done, they don't need a lot of money. It's just to make sure that you have the right people on the ground, that the government contribute by providing the land. You are in a country that you have 100 million mm -hmm. hectares that are not exploited and that are uh, 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 that could be because you have the, 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 the water, you have the, the weather, you have everything, and you can uh, use this as a tool to integrate these people. You can also work on, for example, disenclaving villages through just a small route, and you will fix half of the problem because people sometimes, because they are enclaved, because they don't have access to anything, then they uh, recourse to uh, arms to try to feed themselves. So these kind of things, if you could within the Afri within European Union, within partners that can help uh, to have this kind of support. Uh, also, the European Union is very much involved in um, in the SSR. Security Council is focusing on this. Yesterday, you hear the member states speaking about it. So I think uh, these are the kind of things that we can help as partner uh, uh, through uh, country team, through bilateral, through multilateral, and the mission, the presence of the mission, the advantage to have a mission is to have the leverage and to have the access to the highest at the highest level, speak to the president. It's not a technical level when you have UNDP or you have someone that will work when the space is open. So the mission open the space, can help to open the space. And then it's easy to implement programs. It's just to ensure that uh, this could happen. The other issue that I think, uh, I think the council can help and you can help is to continue to focus on uh, uh, fighting impunity, protecting women and girls, boys, uh, ending uh, abuse of children by armed groups, all these are also uh, uh, area of, because if you are in a community and the country is not able to protect your children, your, your uh, uh, family, then you have no hope and you, 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 you will resort to the same uh, way the other are doing and then people start gathering themselves by ethnicity, by interest, by this, by that, and then undermining state authority. So I think all these uh, elements you can support, but I can see also that the council, by putting pressure sometimes or guiding in resolutions in certain issue when we are confronted to conflict or whatever is uh, uh, would be helpful. I used, as you know, to engage with member states that are open in the council to advise, for example, on uh, uh, what we see as a priority, I would advise you in the council to, to do so, to engage with the people on the ground and to check uh, uh, what would be uh, the first priority that you would like to push at this time, because in general, it's easy to say things, but sometimes in a very specific context, for example, in this situation of tension, political tension, to make sure that to people understand that whatsoever be the stability re rely on uh, the authority, on the authority, the, the, the opposition, the, everyone to focus on the problem of the people, to ensure that we don't keep the situation uh, 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 worsening while we are uh, fighting politically. We can fight politically, but at the same time, we address uh, the problems that the people are facing, and uh, the council can help in this.
Great, David. Thank you very, very much. Um, a, question, a, a number of questions have come from a retired Brigadier General of the Irish Defence Forces, uh, Gerard Hearn. Um, the, the first question from, from Gerard is, is the Intervention Brigade achieving its aims in, in Eastern Congo? Um, I, I mean, this is a subject of some interest to us. And secondly, what impact are the Islamic ADF group having on peace and security in, in North Kivu. If you could take those two, Leila, to begin with, that'd be great. With regard to the, uh, the integrated brigade, you know in, in which context the integrate, integrated brigade came. Uh, uh, and uh, since, uh, uh, since then, there is a lot, lot of things happened in, in the country. Uh, I would like to emphasize here, it's not about the integrated brigade or about any uh, 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 peacekeeping uh, contingent. It's about, first of all, to have uh, uh, the context that allow for a peacekeeping mission, military uh, component of peacekeeping mission to uh, 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 work on what is mandated for. And I think protecting civilian uh, in, uh, uh, in, the, uh, in, in, this, in the area where the integrated brigade uh, is deployed is the first priority. The context is very complex. You have an armed group uh, that, you, that is in this country since 1986. So the, the ADF were, were the, uh, uh, given this place where they are, by Mobutu in, 1886, in 1986, after the coup against Idi Amin. So they, they are connected with the population for this long time. They were doing business, they were working. So it's very, very difficult uh, to just come and by military means you will fix these problems. You need really to ensure that you have on the ground, first of all, the capacity to, uh, and the intelligence to know about what is going on. You are in this area, you, have, you don't have only ADF. You have ADF, you have my, my groups, you have uh, uh, also uh, other uh, 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 spoiler uh, uh, operating in the region. You have uh, uh, the uh, uh, Ebola that, uh, that uh, played in this area. So for us is to make sure that we have the capacity to understand what is going on and to use all the tools. You are also in a context where sometimes you don't have the good uh, uh, cooperation between uh, FRDC and our own uh, military because it's always complex, you know, when you are working with national forces and you are a foreigner and there is not always trust. There is not always uh, sometimes good relationship because you don't speak the same language. There is a lot of things that play. So it's to build the trust. And I think we are improving this because we have changed in the leadership in the FRDC and we are seeing more engagement and cooperation and exchange of, of uh, uh, information. You know that the Security Council put condition for the mission to engage with and to, to engage in uh, offensive operation and to engage with a national partner. You have the due diligence policy, you have the uh, uh, joint planning, and you have to ensure that you protect international humanitarian human rights and refugee laws. So it's not easy for us to just go and rage a war. And if I kill women, if I kill children, it's collateral damage. UN cannot afford that. So we have to ensure that everything is done properly, that we are working, uh, uh, having all the information and operation that need to be conducted, making sure that where we are going, you don't have children, family that are with the, with the armed groups. And in general, it's the case. So all these things need to be assessed and work. Now, the other thing is your capacity as FIB or as to ensure that when you are needed and when there is a need for that, you have to deliver. We have the Santos Cruz report that put clearly what is needed to improve the capacity of the FIB and to ensure that they will deliver on what is expected from them. 
This is discussed now at the Security Council level. At New York level, you know, it's not our decision. It's at New York level mm -hmm. to ensure, and I think they come to an arrangement to uh, move forward on the QRF to not have only people uh, from a certain country, but to ensure that uh, the UN have the ability to bring uh, capacity from outside. They are working on this and hopefully will move uh, forward uh, uh, fairly soon. We are also trying to not leave you, the FIB who are there and we are trying to bring uh, 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 our civilian engaging with the population, engaging with, the, with our military, working through justice, through police, and having our civil affairs staff, human rights, child protection, gender, all involved in to then tell them what is expected from them, hearing from the population, bringing them to hear from the population what's their concern about what they are doing. Also, the most important that we are doing is first, to ensure that the battlefield, the area of operation, is separated from the area where the people live. Because you know the modus operandi of the, of the ADF. To stop the attack against them, they attack civilians. When they attack civilians, they don't come to the city and start killing people. They generally go to people that are isolated, far away from protection and access, they come with machete, they kill a family, and the, the day after you hear about 12 people killed, and you think they rage a whole village. In reality, they enter an isolated place and kill uh, 12 people that are living together. That's the reality that nobody from outside understands. Yeah. So you have to, and that's what we did when we provide, for example, our own base to the FRDC in Simuliki, and we removed our people to ensure they stay there and separate uh, Beni from the area of conflict from Medina. And you noted that since then, they never come inside the city. But they try because they were uh, also uh, uh, in, uh, in very remote area. They commit these kinds of atrocities. So what we are doing is really to put pressure uh, on them and to work on them. Now, the second question that you asked me about what I think about the ADF. As I mentioned, ADF are here since 1986. The conflict with ADF started in, 90, in 2014, as you remember, and it was the FRDC that went to dislodge them from Medina, and we end up with this, uh, with a major crisis at the time, with a lot of civilian killed, and then they stopped the operation and they returned to their place, and that's what happened. Then restart in 2017, you remember because of the election and because of everything and some uh, 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 attention that came, and sometimes as we call here, les tireurs de ficelle that manipulate to, uh, uh, because many people uh, uh, are living uh, uh, out of the economic guerre, and mm -hmm. they have interest in this economic guerre. That's why the, the best response is building state authority, is strengthening the presence of justice, of police, of military, but that are held accountable and that are, of course, under control of the, of the government. So that's why uh, uh, it's the best option. So for the, for the ADF, of course, there is a lot of uh, 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 things that we heard about the linkage between ADF and ISIS. We see in some uh, uh, site uh, attributed to ISIS saying that they uh, they create the wilaya of Central Africa. They are uh, uh, working with the ADF. They sometimes even announce when a uh, uh, killing took place that they are the one who conduct the operation, etc. For the moment, I cannot say that it's true, it's not true, because I'm not in the heart of the jungle. But what we are assessing is what we have on the ground. So what we have is uh, people operating with machete, with uh, 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 sometimes uh, uh, knives or whatever, and ake that come uh, 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 from either inside or outside the country. All the people that were arrested in all the operation that are conducted, we don't have 
people coming from this faraway area. So we don't know, uh, we cannot today say that we have evidence that uh, ISIS is operating in this area. We have evidence that an armed group, a foreign armed group is operating uh, and using terror tactics against civilian population and committing atrocities in this part of the country. Who is this is not very important because the population is paying the very high price because of this uh, uh, terror tactics and because of the targeting of the civilian population in the middle of the night, just to say, if you would like, if you don't stop going after me, I will continue to kill civilian. So that's not acceptable and we have to do our best to stop uh, this group and to, to uh, 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 put pressure on them to lay down their arms. And if not, to continue to put military pressure on them and to continue to use justice. And you know that we arrested, uh, 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 the government arrested many of, uh, of even some of their leader. And uh, after what happened, uh, the uh, evasion in the prison, we, MONUSCO, transported them to Kinshasa for, to ensure that they will respond for their crimes uh, here and not be maybe released or uh, manage to flee. So we are trying to do our best to ensure that our FIB, our police, our civilian uh, component, and the work at national level here in Kinshasa and there to uh, uh, convince, uh, uh, to uh, uh, reduce the threat of this group. And of course, those who are working to identify if there is any link for the moment, we cannot uh, assume this, we don't have evidence, but we don't, we don't exclude anything. Yeah. We, don't, we don't exclude anything, we don't say it's not true. We say that at this stage, we don't have clear evidence. We continue to consider this group using terror tactic for an armed group, preying on the population, and it's in itself dangerous. We don't need to, to check if he has other connection. He, he yeah. has enough, enough, uh, he's a, an enough threat on the people that we have to deal with. So I hope I answer your question. Yeah, we, we perhaps, thank you very much for that. So we perhaps have time for maybe uh, two or three final questions. Um, and so the first would be the question of new technologies. Do you think that they have a contribution to make uh, uh, to the protection of civilians? Secondly, uh, impunity. Could you say something about the work of the ICC uh, in, in the DRC? Uh, and the questioner refers in particular to the UN mapping report on human rights violations of 2010. And finally, um, uh, do you think there is a likelihood of the political tension in Kinshasa that you've been talking about spilling over to the military situation in the East, uh, especially because individual groups operating in the East have political patrons in, in Kinshasa? If you're able to manage those as three final topics, we'd be delighted. You've, you've already covered a terrific uh, a range of issues, but I, I hand it over to you for those last three points. Thank you very much. First of all, with regard to the intelligence uh, 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 technology that we, uh, we are trying to, to use, as I mentioned, when you go to this area, particularly when we speak about uh, the area of ADF, but not only, even if you go to Pinga, if you go to uh, uh, Ituri, if you go to Masisi, to Walikali, this is a, a forest covered area. So it's very, very difficult to access. It's not something that is open. You are in an area that you don't have roots and it's a, a mountain, it's a, a forest covered area. And the population is totally uh, dispersed in all these areas. So it's not like you have a village, you protect this village and you are fine. It's uh, you are protecting the city, but someone will go and kill six people. And the day after you did not protect civilian because it's the headlines and you will never prevent it because people, because state authority is not deployed everywhere so you know, it's in the middle age, people, how they lived. 
they live far from place where they would be attacked. They try to be within their family and very close people that they trust to live because there is no law and order. You know that. So we are in this context. So in this context, having this capacity that allow you to identify, for example, people that are moving in a place that they are not used to be. Identify who are these people? Are they men? Are they with women, with children? Uh, are they building some place where there is nothing? So that will help you to and just to see maybe and to be proactive against threat. When you get an information that there is something in the making in such a place, you will check if it is true or if it is someone who's trying to play game with you. So you, you will have this capacity. Uh, that's why we use the UIS first, that cover now all the North Kivu and Ituri and even part of South Kivu, which is great. And you know, since I arrived, I pushed very hard to build, to, to, uh, uh, um, to amplify this capacity because it was just covering 70 kilometers and we pushed mm -hmm. to have 510 kilometers. So which allow us to check when we heard about something, when someone is abducted, when someone, we can, we can use this capacity. The second thing is to help the FRDC to organize their operation to prepare to know where they are going and if there is a risk for the civilian population, if the people are embedded in, within community, how we can address this kind of groups because many of the groups are not believing outside of their community. So very difficult also to uh, uh, go after them. The third thing that is important for, for us with regard to these tools is also to, uh, to identify where we can uh, uh, have an added value. If you identify a group of people isolated, but you can do a route, you can do something, you can uh, engage with, the, with the, uh, uh, someone that is from this area to take. So for me, it's very important that you have this capacity at your disposal, your military have this capacity that is not used for us, it's used with the FRDC. It's to help also build their capacity, to help them to prepare for an operation, to not go uh, uh, with uh, closed eyes and then have, so that's for me important. And I hope we'll continue to use this capacity uh, because it's with the consent of the government and it's a tool that is not put within the FIB, it's for, for the mission to work on this. It's for all of us. The second thing with regard to uh, 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 fighting impunity, uh, of course, fighting impunity for me as a judge is the first thing that I would mm -hmm. like to do. You, so, you know, because for me, uh, uh, if you have, if people are committing such a, a, a heinous crimes, it's because they enjoy impunity. I remember when I arrived in 2008, and I started engaging with the people on the ground. And I discussed with some military at the time, if you rape a woman, what will happen to you? Just very candid question like this. And I heard, uh, I will pay a goat. I will be arrested for a few days or nothing. So that's why we decided to change this mindset and to work to help the military justice. I remember when we started saying we will support military justice, many people were against this because they say military justice don't bind by international law. They don't respect the uh, fair trial principle. And I said we will help them because it's the only tool that can hold accountable military. It's, they have jurisdiction on their military, on police, and on, on armed groups. So if we would like to address the impunity in these uh, 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 people, then we have to empower the military justice. And we will ensure that we respect the fair trial principle by providing the support. And that's how we put in place the joint investigation team 
between human rights and the military uh, uh, police, and then the prosecution support cell that come inside our own expert embedded working with the military to help him do what? To help him ensure that rather than focusing on confession, ending up torturing a uh, suspect to focus on gathering evidence. And since we started this process in 2008, we don't have one case that one uh, 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 accused came to the court and said I was tortured. Mm -hmm. So that's not nothing. That's we are in the middle of a war that in other places they torture to get evidence. And we managed to work with the prosecutor that gather evidence without focusing on the confession. This is not nothing. And thousands of people were tried through this process, colonel, generals, uh, uh, lead of armed group, the latest was uh, uh, Cheka, and, and we don't have someone who said I was tortured and I was forced to, uh, to uh, confess and I deny what I said. That's what happened when you have this kind of case. The second thing is also to showcase to the people that the one who did wrong to you, even general, he's held accountable. That's why we put the mobile court. The mobile court was to allow for the justice to do, go to the place where the crimes were committed and to allow for hearing the victims and the witnesses. Otherwise, if you do it in another place, maybe he will end up acquitted because the victims and the, the witnesses cannot all come to the place to testify. And as I mentioned, we managed to have Avocats Sans Frontières and uh, about American Bar Association want to support the victim and want to support the accused. And that's, that's how we build the fight against impunity. And it's not something that was created outside and when you close, it's over. It's not an international tribunal for a few days and a few years or months and then it's over. It's mm. the justice of the Congo and it's building their own capacity. And it's giving the pride to the military judges to be to help the accountable the leadership in the army. I'm not saying that everything is perfect. I'm speaking about the opportunity, the building capacity, the moving. Because of course, when you have the uh, uh, the, the political involvement, when you maybe you will have judges that will be subverted, that will be. But this could happen everywhere. But what we want is to create the capacity and to allow for people to see that they can do it. It's not something complex that they cannot afford it. And they can do it. Now our challenge is to ensure sustainability when the mission leaves. Our, our uh, challenge is to ensure that uh, a place that we leave where you, military justice is not competent because it's post-conflict, is to ensure that this capacity exists also in civilian justice, is mm -hmm. to have the capacity to solve conflict on access to land, whatever, through justice, not through arms. So that's how you build the, the, the stability through all these tools that you put in place. Now, with regard to the mapping report, as you know, the mapping report covered the period 1993-2003. to that's 10 years during the turmoil in Congo. Yeah. The report was uh, 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 finalized. Of course, the report is speaking about uh, uh, what the people told them and the evidence that they gathered it through uh, interviews. So it's not, uh, uh, it's not any just judiciary investigation. It's gathering information through the people that went through hell at the time, all the people that spoke about killing, about abuse, about rape, about burning villages, etc., in many places. So if the international community have the appetite to support an international tribunal to address these past crimes, Nobody will be unhappy. Even the president yesterday mentioned that he, uh, that he was asked for, uh, to create people asking for creating international tribunal and uh, a mixed chamber. 
But this is, of course, the willingness of international community to put their uh, weight in this and to, you know, how this tribunal uh, uh, function and uh, what's uh, the, the budget that is needed and how the, 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 the competence, etc. Now you have also ICC and Congo and the neighbor, they all ratified ICC. Mm. And as you know, ICC is a complementary jurisdiction to the Congolese jurisdiction. So if there is impunity or incapacity of the justice in Congo to address certain crimes of the past of, of today, then also if there is an, an, uh, an agreement to go to the international court and work on that, they can go. Now we have cases that are still uh, pending in, in the international court. You have Boscon Taganda that was at the time uh, in Goma when I was here 2008 with, uh, with uh, integrated with the CNDP in the army. So you have uh, other cases that were closed in the past so ICC, uh, when I arrived here in 2008, the prosecutor came here and discussed certain uh, cases and explained that if the government don't address certain cases, of course, the court, can, the court can jump in. They are also working on reparation of victims in Ituri after the, uh, the uh, trial of Bosco Taganda, of uh, Thomas Lobanga and of others uh, uh, were finalized. So for me, complementarity is uh, something important. Uh, strengthening the capacity of national institution is more durable. And for me, it's the most important for sustainability, for uh, building the capacity. Doing both, I have no problem with that. If mm. we can do both, of course we can do both because the amount of uh, crimes and uh, uh, crisis that went through Congo for the last 20 years uh, deserve that justice be uh, uh, rendered and mm. that the victims and the uh, perpetrator will be held accountable. Lastly, you spoke about, you asked me about the, uh, uh, um, the tension that is taking place. Yeah. I don't want to call it crisis at this stage. Mm. I hope it will not be crisis. I hope that it will stay tension between politicians mm. and at the end they will find a way out themselves. I always repeat that I'm not the one who will say to the Congolese, uh, uh, you have to keep a coalition, you have to go for cohabitation, you have to go for, it's not me. Um, my role is to help them to do the right thing, to not uh, uh, miss opportunity for building the peace of the longer term, but it's their decision to decide what they want for their country. And if they are able to achieve it, we will be all the first to applaud because we are not here to tell them you have to do it this way. I, 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 it's not my way of doing things, but it's not the right way, even if you, someone else would like to do it because it will not work. It will not be sustainable and it will not help. The best way is to help people to take the right decision give them the opportunity to see the risk, to be proactive and to move in the right direction. So do we think that there is a risk that the situation will affect the East? If it will stay for a long time, yes, of mm. course. If it, if it will stay, the tension will stay just because not necessarily because people will try to manipulate, but for sure because the situation will not uh, uh, will create. Uh, you will have a vacuum without decision coming, and people will uh, 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 benefit from this. And of course, the spoiler are so many. And as I mentioned, you have for a long time economy guerre, people that are preying on the population, uh, etc. So if the government will not uh, very quickly return to uh, focusing on business on on. Uh, uh, building, uh, uh, taking care of the need of the people, addressing the problems, uh, holding accountable those who may uh, prey on the population, then of course, uh, um, on dit en français, la nature a horreur du vide. Nature cannot sustain the vacuum. Exactly. 
someone yeah. else will jump the in the vacuum. Yes. Yeah. So yeah. so then someone else will jump in the vacuum and you don't know what yeah. you will do with it within it. So that's why uh, we will do our best to continue to support the Congolese authority, the people the, speaking to everyone, helping everyone to move forward in the right direction and solve their conflict. Uh, it's normal that you have this kind of tension. As I said, we are in a learning process. Mm. All what we want is to, to not last for a long time. And we find we, we end up with a solution that is sustainable and allow for these people to focus on the problem of the people until 2023, when the election will election. decide uh, and to prepare for this election, because it's also we cannot wait until 2023, because you have to prepare for the election, you have to ensure that you are ready. And then in 2023, the people will decide, hopefully, in peaceful way, uh, uh, with uh, uh, who will lead them for the next uh, uh, time. So that's yeah. uh, my uh, my answer to your question. Yeah, thank you so much. Uh, we've gone over time, unfortunately, but you you really managed to uh, give us a, a, a fascinating overview of the many challenges that you're facing, that Monusco is facing, and that we're all facing, in a sense, in in the DRC. Um, I, I'm sure our audience uh, uh, hugely appreciated what you had to say. I'm sorry there isn't more time available. So we wish you every success. Uh, as you uh, well in relation to the the progressive uh, drawdown and also the joint strategy, uh, I, I, I'm I'm uh, hugely uh, impressed by the range of challenges which uh, all of that is going to involve. Uh, but the best of luck from us. Thank you for the uh, insights and the tips you have given in relation to Ireland's. Uh, membership of the Security Council, where uh, I, I'm sure my colleagues will will work in every way to support you and your mission. Thank you so much, Leila. And to everybody listening, let me say this is the last of our Development Matters series for this year, but we look forward to uh, a further series for 2021. So thank you very much indeed. Thank you, Leila. Thank you. Thank you. Bonjour. Merci.